I want to welcome you to this first session in our charge symposium this year. Um, it's great to have you here and this one I think you'll find is a really interesting uh, talk to, st to kick things off with. This concept of a vestibular rehabilitation specifically with respect to charge was spurred by conversations with David Brown several years ago uh, where we were talking about some of the behaviors and positioning that we see in a lot of our kids with charge. We combine that with the fact that between Violette and Gretchen, uh, we've had some tremendous experience in some of the really leaders in pediatric vestibular problems and management. So we thought we'd put together a panel leveraging their expertise and experience. And much like everything else you'll see here, we really draw upon the experiences that our families live through. And so we're very thankful to have Robin Fink with us as well. Uh, she and Grayson have lived through this, and they have a unique perspective and experiences that I think are really on point. So to start things off, Violette's going to talk about some relevant vestibular anatomy and physiology, and thanks for coming along. No problem. Okay. So good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here at the CHARGE convention this morning, and hello to all of you at home. This morning, I'm going to describe for you all a little bit about the human vestibular system and specifically how it is different in children with charge. So the vestibular system is made up of cues from the eyes. So what your eyes bring in, what your inner ears bring in, and then the proprioceptors. So for example, the muscles and how your feet feel the world. All three of those senses are brought together in the brain, which helps us balance. So that's a simplistic model of how the human vestibular system works. And I'm going to read for you this lengthy quote from David Brown describing for us, um, and he wrote this for the California Deafblind Services and Resources. And he says that children with charge are also likely to be amongst the most truly multi-sensory impaired people you meet, having difficulties not just with vision and hearing, but also with the senses that perceive balance, touch, temperature, pain, pressure, and smell. The many different anomalies associated with charge will each impose different, varying, and often conflicting demands upon the child. And one of the most pervasive, but least understood of these is the missing sense of balance. So hopefully this morning, we'll be able to give you a good idea of why that is so important for children. <clears throat> so let's start with eyes. Many of you know this from your own personal experience, and so I'm just going to share with you all the possibilities here. So children with charge often experience coloboma of the eyes, and that occurs in approximately 80 to 90% of children with charge. They also experience facial nerve palsy, which can um, affect their blinking ability on that side. They can, uh, they can expect visual acuity issues in 90% or more ptosis, so they may have drooping of one of their eyelids or both, amblyopia or strabismus, cataracts, retinal detachment, and finally, they may also experience photophobia. These factors alone are mm -hmm. enough to cause a balance disturbance in kiddos with charge. Next, we're going to discuss the proprioceptors. So proprioception, a lot of our kids with charge experience low muscle tone, decreased strength due to impaired muscle length, muscle imbalances, and sometimes they also have joint abnormalities. So sometimes their joints are too flexible and sometimes their joints are too stiff. So this can also cause an issue with balance as well when we're working with our kids. And finally, what I'm most familiar with as an audiologist are the abnormalities that can occur with the inner ear. So first we're going to talk about the outer ear and our, um, Adorable kiddos with charge often have short or wide or little or no earlobe. Um, they can have abnormal helixes, triangular shaped concha. They can have weak cartilage, which makes it difficult sometimes to wear a hearing aid or a cochlear implant because it's heavy on their ears. They may have asymmetrical ears. The middle ear is also affected. Sometimes, in most cases, they have malformed bones in the middle ear space. And on my picture here, what you can see is that is defined by this orange section here. And finally, the inner ear, which is the most important for balance, can also be have some abnormalities as well. So they may have an incomplete cochlea, 
And what we often find in almost all of our cases that we've seen over the years in kiddos with charge is that they have absent semicircular canals. Um, and that is represented here in this purple section up here, you see these like three little semicircular shaped canals here, but that is our internal ear gyroscope. So we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, but in most of the cases that we've seen in the lab, most of the kids don't even have semicircular canals or have incomplete sem semicircular canals. <laughs> they also have dysplasia of the vestibule. So let's see if I can get my pointer to pop up. Um, in between the canals and the cochlea, the snail-shaped organ, is the vestibule shape, and that can be um, dysplastic at birth. And finally, they may have some abnormalities of their auditory nerve. So the auditory nerve is what takes the information from the inner ear and brings it up to the brain. So what we've discussed so far is that our sweet little guys have issues with their eyes. We also know they have issues with their inner ears. And finally, there can be concerns with the proprioception as well. But what we haven't discussed is the brain. Um, and when all those senses come into the brain, what we know is the brain is able to take that information and produce a couple of different reflexes. The first one is the vestibular spinal reflex, which helps us balance. So you can imagine being in an elevator. Whenever you feel that elevator go up, you feel that sense in your stomach like, ooh, we just moved. When that happens, what your inner ear senses, that gravitational change, tells the brain, uh-oh, we're moving. The brain then turns on muscles in your neck, your back, and your legs to help you keep your balance. It doesn't want you to fall in the elevator. So that whole reflex happens instantaneously. The same is true when you're about to fall. When you start to sense that you're tipping over, your natural reaction is to put your hands out to catch yourself. And what we find in a lot of cases with our kiddos with charge is that they often, their moms will say they face plant or they hit their heads very easily or they don't have that sense of being able to catch themselves. And that's because their inner ear isn't sensing that gravity change to then tell the brain to catch yourself. The second portion of that is the vestibular ocular reflex. So in addition to just balancing, your inner ear also talks to your mm -hmm. eyes. So whenever you are looking at me on the camera or on, the, on your monitors today, if you shake your head very lightly, hopefully I stay in one place. Um, that's your vestibular ocular reflex coming into play. But what we know about our little friends with charge is that when they shake their head or their head's in motion or they're running, things might look a little jiggly or blurry because they're not getting that sense that they're moving. So the brain therefore doesn't tell the eyes to hold everything still. So just to go over the balance issues, we'll often see, see unsteadiness, falling, clumsiness. Our parents often tell us that their kiddo is not able to keep up with their peers, that they have a lot of issues when it's dark or that they're walking on um, angulated surfaces. So a lot of our parents will say, it's really difficult when he walks from carpet to hardwood floor or steps off the curb or walks from um, the boardwalk into sand. So those surfaces are really tricky for them because now we're messing with the proprioception cues or we're messing with what visual cues they have. We'll also see visual issues. So our little friends will tell us that they have trouble reading or that the words seem to be jumbly on the page. Or uh, one of our little guys, um, their mother said that when he runs to kick the soccer ball, he'll approach the soccer ball, but then has to completely stop before he kicks the ball. So therefore the ball is looking like it's um, still moving or that it's jiggling and he has to completely stop to focus on the ball and then kicks it. So it's not a, it's not a fluid run up to the ball and then kick it. So I like everything in um, pictures. I like, I'm a very visual learner. So I picked these um, little gifts today to show you, for example, that on your cell phone, your cell phone, whenever you turn it, the picture flips for you. Or in this case, in this game, um, as this person is falling, you're able to tilt your phone so that you can move this guy. And the reason for that is that your phone has a gyroscope inside of it. So it knows motion. Your inner ears are exactly that for you. When you move, your inner ear senses the change in motion, whether it be a head turn, bending over to tie your shoe, going up in that elevator, going forward in your car. Your inner ear is sensing that change in motion, and therefore, it tells the brain to make the correction for your body. 
Second, this picture shows a man shaking his head and keeping his eyes hopefully still. And what we also know, again, is that our little kiddos have a difficult time keeping objects steady when they move. So you may notice that they like to hold your hand as long as possible so that they can really focus on objects and that they can also get a good sense of what they're stepping onto. You may also notice that they shuffle their feet so that they can keep their feet on the floor as much as possible as they move. And in our vestibular lab, we have um, a lot of tests that we can do. And oftentimes we don't do all of these tests with our kiddos, uh, but these are examples of what we do in the vestibular lab. Um, for example, we have the rocket ship or the rotary chair, and we can get a good sense of the eye movement. You can see in these pictures, um, some of the kids are wearing goggles. And again, we're monitoring that vestibular ocular reflex. Um, we have foam, we have um, different things where we put sensors on the neck muscles to see if that indeed the brain was able to tell the muscles to turn on. And our most important considerations for kiddos with charge is that they are safe. So today we're going to have Gretchen talk to you in a moment about the considerations we make when we recommend vestibular rehabilitation. So we're going to be considering safety as our top priority. Um, like I said, a lot of these kiddos don't know to put their hands out to catch themselves. So it's not that they can never do it. A lot of our kids don't walk until they're age three or even up to age five or seven years old. So if you have a little one at home who's 17 months old and they're not walking yet, we will get them there. They can do this. And so even though they have difficulty with vision and difficulty with, with um, inner ear and difficulty with proprioception, we've seen it before. These kiddos may take a little bit longer, but it is able to happen. And that brings me to that third point there is retraining. So in a lot of cases with our kids with charge, your brain is perfect. And so cognition in a lot of cases is really good. So even though they have all these challenges with the eyes and the inner ears and the musculature, we just need to retrain the brain. And that's where our physical therapy comes in, is that we just have to learn it in a different way. It's not gonna be the traditional way that we teach balance, but we're going to retrain the brain to learn it in a different way. Thanks, V. So one of the questions that popped into my head uh, was that well, some of the feedback we've gotten from our families is that it's really difficult or it's not possible to do vestibular testing in young kids. And then if you layer on top of that, having a diagnosis of charge syndrome, it's also really difficult. So what's been your experience that way? Yes. Um, so in a, in a lot of cases, we just adapt the test battery so that we're able to test kids with charge syndrome. So they may not get the full test that everybody else gets. And that would be true of any, you know, 17 month old, for example. But we do have ability to test um, anybody. All right. So on your screens, you'll see a polling questions that popped up uh, that Violet and Gretchen had uh, posited for us uh, to throw out at this point. So feel free and respond to that on your screens whenever you're ready. And then I wanted to introduce Gretchen, who's from our Department of Physical Therapy. Uh, I can't think of anybody who's got more experience when it comes to uh, doing vestibular rehabilitation with our children, in particular our complex children, such as those with charge. So Gretchen, thanks for coming today. Absolutely, happy to be here. Um, so we're just going to let this um, poll stand up here for just a few more seconds. Um, but yes, I've been working with VLF for about 10 years now um, in the Pediatric Balance Center. It's such a pleasure um, to, to work here at Children's and, um, and to meet all of the wonderful families that come into the Pediatric Balance Center. So it's been quite the pleasure. Really enjoy it. So we'll just give you guys a few more seconds to get those answers rolling in and we'll look forward to hearing them in a bit here. Very good. Okay, so I am going to talk to you today about vestibular rehabilitation. Um, Violette did a wonderful job of explaining the anatomy um, in your children with charge and, and how it relates to their balance system. I'm going to talk to you about that retraining part. How do we retrain the balance system um, of a child with charge? And um, oftentimes what we find the most common thing with them when we go through that vestibular audiology testing is that their inner ears are not doing what they're supposed to be doing for 
um, you know, for their balance system. They're, so we call it vestibular hypofunction or weakness. Um, you'll see that in, you know, in reports and things along that line. So when we know that those inner ears are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, we need to, even though their vision and their muscles and joints are still affected, that proprioceptive input, we need to really hone in and, and retrain um, the eyes and the feet to kick in and substitute for what the inner ears cannot do. Okay, from a from a balance standpoint. So, um, because of that lack of full development of the balance system, our children with charge are at very high risk for gross motor delays, which you guys know. And so, oftentimes early on in that infancy, we see delays with sitting and walking, for instance. Um, these children are very heavily reliant to keep whatever surface they can touch, you know, in touch with their hands and with their feet, with their hips. So they're very hesitant to let go. We see this time and time again. So with sitting, um, it's much, you know, as they're learning to sit, it's much easier for them to keep one hand on the surface and manipulate a toy with the opposite hand rather than release that hand, you know, start to clap or bring, you know, bring blocks together, things along that line. Just that little change in, in play, you know, can affect their balance and how comfortable they feel, um, you know, with being able to engage with those toys. And then with standing and walking, like Violet alluded to, you, you know, your children are very hesitant to let go, you know, as they're first starting to stand, they want to lean against a surface, they want to hold on to the couch, they, they're very hesitant to let go because those inner ears can't give them that extra input for balance. So they're using the joints um, and the feel of the surface underneath them and around them. Um, and that could be just your hand as well. And so getting them the confidence and the training in order to feel, you know, to know that they can let go of that external support is really the PT's job in, in moving them forward with those gross motor skills. So there's def different um, <laughs> strategies that we use with vestibular rehab, but the one specific to our children with charge is what we call substitution strategies. So like I alluded to, we're training the eyes and the joints, whether that's the hands or the feet, to provide that balance information mm -hmm. when, the, um, when the ears cannot. So you can see this little girl here in that first picture. You know, she's got her hand just slightly on the surface as she raises the opposite hand. Um, and so it's just a, a good example of that developing balance system. So when it comes to sitting balance, what we know in infants and children, particularly up to three years old, is that they are most reliant on vision for balance, okay? And so we need to, we need to utilize that, um, even knowing that, you know, that your children have coloma and they've got visual acuity issues, we need to continue to strengthen that. And so when it comes to sitting balance, providing them with a visual focus with a toy, um, you know, either in front of them or off to the side, something visually that they, they can focus on will help give them that sense of balance, okay? Um, having a lot going on in their environment is going to, um, you know, kind of sway that a bit. And so anything we can do to kind of keep things centered for them is going to be very, um, very helpful in that respect. Um, but like I said, we still need to consider the joints, okay? And we still need to figure out how the muscles are going to help give them those cues. So we use lots of different surfaces. Obviously, a nice firm, you know, floor um, surface is going to be the most stable for these children. And so we need to challenge um, their, their proprioception by having them sit and eventually stand and walk on different surfaces. So we'll utilize different foam pads or cushions or within a therapy session, like the therapy ball that's on this picture here, um, to really challenge the, the muscles in that proprioception. Now, when it comes to walking, um, again, like we've, like we've said, they're very fearful to let go of the furniture or your hand in order to continue walking. They're reliant on that external support, okay? So it's our job as PTs to to continue to, to provide those strategies um, and train them so that they feel comfortable and balanced enough to stand and walk on their own. Um, you know, when we think about the reflexes that Violette talked about, that vestibular spinal reflex that gives you the um, cue that you feel like you're falling, you know, the natural reaction for us is to put our hands out and catch ourselves. If we're always practicing walking, holding on to something, then our children cannot um, practice the, um, the act of standing and walking, having those hands free in order for them to 
to train um, that reflex. And so we have to provide a lot of training with the walking, um, giving them more support of their trunk, um, rather than always holding onto their hands and having them hold onto something. That's a very important part of the rehab process for standing and walking. So initially we might still have them hold like some toys in their hands, <laughs> um, like you know blocks or bean bags or something like that. But um, so they can still feel it, but they're not actually getting that external support from um, from a surface, if you will. Now, beyond walking, okay, so the connection between the brain and the muscles is not as timely, okay? So, well, you know, our children are definitely at, at higher risk for falling. Um, we hear time and time again from parents that their children will, you know, face plant um, because they can't as quickly get those hands out to catch themselves. Um, so they're at much higher, you know, fall risk. And so beyond walking, since these connections are not automatic and we have to train them, um, you know, it's, you know, we need to take um, the different environments that the children are in and challenge them in those environments. So walking on um, different surfaces, um, particularly uneven ground, grass, mulch, you know, being at the playground, sand, all of those are going to be more challenging. Your kids are going to be more hesitant and careful, um, you know, things along that line. And so lots of training on those different surfaces and standing and walking is going to be part particularly helpful for them. Something we take for granted, walking up and down the stairs, okay, is a challenge. You don't think about it, but when you're stepping down, walking down a stair, you do have to briefly for a couple seconds balance on one foot in order to reach the step below, okay? So our kids will want to hold on to the rail and they will want to just take one step at a time rather than stepping down to the, the step below it. And so it's our job to to provide you know, strategies for them to get them comfortable um, with walking up and down stairs, particularly if you, you, know, if you live in a multi-story home, that's an everyday activity for them that is so important for their, um, for their vitality and safety um, in, you know, in your own home. All right. So again, the safety is our, is our biggest thing here. And, you know, and that's our job to work with you guys in order to facilitate the training of these of the balance system in order to make them safe in their home and community uh, community. So um, like Violet talked about with the uh, vestibular ocular reflex. OK, so um, that that reflex allows us to be able to walk and turn our head and talk to someone while still being able to clearly see the environment in front of us, okay? Um, this, this reflex is not as robust, it's not as um, strong, and so for our children with charge, things may look blurry or shaky, um, and so we need to get them comfortable moving in their environment and being able to turn their head again, for safety, so they can see what's in their environment and see what's around them. And it's not just side to side, but up and down as well. So moving in that vertical plane so that they can, um, you know, as they're walking, they see a, um, you know, an object in front of them that they, you know, they don't want to step on it. So they have to recognize it, or maybe they just want to pick it up and play with it. So they have to, you know, walk toward it, move their head down, squat down, pick it up and come back up. Um, so moving that head up and down and then continue walking. It's, a, it's something again that, you know, we take advantage for those of us that have, a, you know, a very functional balance system. And it's such a complex um, movement for our children that, that don't. And so, um, so again, that's part of our, our job as well. Now, because of, um, you know, the child's coloboma and visual acuity issues, we do have to take that into effect as well when we're talking about this, this vestibular ocular reflex. And so um, it's important for us to note um, as we're evaluating a child, if they hold their head in a certain posture because one eye is stronger than the other, um, you know, getting them comfortable, being able to use as much of their visual field as they can um, when moving in their environment. I'm just going to show you a quick video here, if I can. Perfect. So this little girl here, she does have what we, you know, we talked about that bilateral vestibular hypofunction. Her inner ears are not providing her balance. She does not have charge, but, and she's moving very quickly in her environment. But what you can see, hopefully, as we... Not sure that's going to work, Rachel. Right? Okay. Um, if we can get this video to play is our children do have, uh, you know, very much a challenge with 
moving in a straight path while turning their head. Okay. So oftentimes what we see is as they're moving and they turn their head to look at something, they kind of veer in the direction that they were moving and then maybe come back to the, you know, to that straight path. So, you know, it's very, um, it can look wobbly, it can look unsteady. Um, and so again, providing them with strategies to be able to turn their head and move, um, you know, move in a, in a straightforward path is, is a big deal as well. So I apologize, the video's not functioning, but that's okay. Um, so in conclusion, you know, the balance system of child with charge really has to be trained for them to be safe in, in you know, various environments. And um, being able to move around safely in your environment really promotes that social interaction and play with their peers, which we know that, you know, you as parents, you know, really desire for your child. And so we're just thrilled to be able to work with them and, and help move them forward with that. Thanks, Gretchen. So the very cool parts for me is how practical you keep it. Mm -hmm. Like it really translates to day-to-day -day life. Um, and as we transition over to Robin, um, you know, I'm curious, Robin, does any of that, the clinical observations and things that Gretchen mentioned, do those resonate with you? Like, have you yeah. seen those in Grayson? So it's funny that you say that because as they're uh, both Fila and Gretchen are giving their presentations, I'm like, oh yeah, um, Grayson has this, 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 like uh -huh. all of those things. I'm like, check, 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 check. Oh, we did that. Check, check, check. So yeah, it really, it really does, you know, kind of resonate with exactly, you know, what we have seen in Grayson and, and why um, we decided to do vestibular therapy and why we felt like it really has been like a great opportunity for us. So that's so cool. All right. Yeah. So to introduce Robin, uh, she has a son, Grayson, that uh, she's promised to show lots of cute pictures of as she goes through her talk. <laughs> uh, but she's a really great example of um, one of the families we get to work with at our charge center. And, you know, their feedback, the feedback that you guys give us in terms of this is what my challenges are with my kid. This is what we really like to prioritize and work on. Really helps steer our clinical activities as well as some of the innovative stuff we try to develop. So thanks very much for joining yeah. us. Appreciate it. So I, my name's Robin, like um, Dr. Shu said. And so I have a son, Grayson, who is five and a half. Um, we live in Northern Kentucky, so we have been very fortunate and lucky enough to pretty much get all of our care at Cincinnati Children's, um, which has just been great for us. Um, so he was born with CHARGE syndrome and spent several months in the NICU at Children's. Um, we got a diagnosis, I think about a month after he was born. Like they think they pretty much knew that he had charge syndrome right when he was born. So I felt like we were lucky in that we kind of got, we were in that from the beginning, we knew what we were dealing with and we had all these great resources to kind of help him along the way. So some of the things that he deals with, um, he's G tube fed, um, pretty much exclusively. Um, he had a tracheostomy tube from about a month old until April of this year when we got rid of that. So, yay. yeah, yeah. Um, we're pretty excited about that. Um, he um, does have profound hearing loss in both ears um, and is, was not a candidate for cochlear implants. Um, so we, he, we exclusively communicate with um, ASL um, and he's doing pretty great with that. Um, like pretty much many kids with CHARGE syndrome, he does have um, several inner ear abnormalities. Pretty much everything that um, Violette talked about, we have all of those things. Um, so, um, I'm trying to think of some, yeah. So he's been walking, um, Grayson started walking right around two years old. Um, so he, um, we had a pretty great PT that came to the house through um, Kentucky's First Steps. Um, and so a lot of the um, things that Gretchen was talking about, using the toys and the hands to help him kind of move, um, that really, I think, helped him. So he, But he was very um, unstable, I think, even when he started walking. Um, he fell frequently, like um, I think everybody has said, kind of that face planting, not putting his hands out, um, falling backwards, um, the same as forward and backwards, you know, kind of like a, a tree falling whichever direction he went it was a not like protecting his head um a couple times we've had um, where he had ended up having to get stitches above his eyebrow um and then um, almost a concussion one time so kind of after a couple of those things we're like yeah we need to do, we need to find something to help him be safer because he's an active little boy um so the wonderful lucy 
said, hey, have you heard about vestibular therapy? And I was like, no. So she sent us um, the information and we um, were able to get a vestibular assessment. Um, I think he was three years old, um, which, you know, basically confirmed what we were not surprised to learn that he had vestibular hypofunction. Um, do we have the little like, clicky thing? I guess I should show you a picture of him as I'm talking. Um, so, yeah, there he is. This was recently, he doesn't have a trach anymore. It's still kind of weird to see him without his trach. Um, so we did the assessment, um, vestibular, per, bilateral peripheral vestibular hypofunction there. Um, so he was a great candidate, I think, for um, vestibular rehabilitation therapy. Um, and we were lucky enough that they have a vestibular PT in Northern Kentucky, so it made it really convenient for us. Um, so we have done two rounds of um, 12 weeks of therapy, um, vestibular therapy, once in 2018 and then again in 2019. Um, we typically don't do therapy um, outside of the school during the school year, so we kind of do it in the summer. It just makes it easier. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think that doing that therapy has helped him be so much more stable, so much more safe. Um, he, we, they worked on um, learn, helping him um, strengthen his arms and his hands um, to learn to put those out when he falls. Um, I would, he still falls frequently, um, but I would say the vast majority of the time if he falls forward, he puts his hands out and catches himself. Um, rarely does he fall where he hits his head um, anymore. Um, so that I've seen that's a great improvement. Um, when he first started, he was very unstable on um, anything other than like a, a flat, like hardwood surface. Um, so carpet was fine too, but like grass, sand, mulch, gravel, pretty much any of those things. You could see that he didn't like that, like walking on that. It was unstable. Um, for an example, we went to the beach that year um, and he wouldn't walk at all on the sand. Um, it was very, I think, just disconcerting for him. Mm -hmm. um, we went to the beach this year. He was literally running and covered in sand the entire time we were there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of a good example of showing you like what this therapy has been able to do for him. And then this picture right here, I think is great too. When we first started, he wouldn't get on a swing at all, not even the big platform swings. Um, the only way we could get him on there was to bribe him with an, a puzzle, an ABC puzzle. And then once you started to move it, he was like, no, I'm done. But here he's a, sitting on the swing by himself, balancing, um, and you can push him and he can stay on the swing. So I think it's really done a lot to help him um, improve his balance and that kind of thing. So um, the big button is forward. Yeah, there we go. So here's the beach this summer, um, and he's standing on gravel and like a rocky surface, um, which he walked over by himself, got there without holding hands or anything like that. So um, he's really learning these strategies, I think, to uh, help him and help him with his balance, help him to feel comfortable on different surfaces. He can run now like out in the grass, like up and down hills. Um, that was another challenge with like going up a hill. Mm -hmm. um, so I think even the therapies helped with his muscle tone, um, strengthening that, learning how to use his vision um, to help him um, balance in different situations, help him to be safe if he falls. Um, he's doing better on stairs. We still have um, a challenge is to go going downstairs, mm -hmm. I think is probably more difficult for a lot of kids than going upstairs. Um, but this past summer, he we caught him walking up the front stairs to our house with no, there's no rails by himself. So well, that was a pretty big deal. And I tried to get him to do it again to do a, to catch it on video, but he wouldn't. <laughs> so you never have your video when you need it. But it was pretty awesome. So um, all of these things, I are just really to say that if you can do vestibular therapy, if you are able to, I think it's a great great thing for um for the, for them they it helps them to be more independent to be safe um and i think it's an ongoing thing too um so we have done two rounds and then taken breaks in between because you know sometimes things get a little much if you keep doing it non-stop but you know it's on my 
my never ending list of things to do again, maybe um, this next summer um, to work on still. We still have challenges with going downstairs. Um, falling backwards is still a challenge. I think that's a harder thing to for kids to do safely. Um, he doesn't seem to have the reflex where you protect your chin. Um, so that's something that we had talked about with his vestibular therapist working on in the future. So um, that's the great thing about vestibular therapy or any kinds of PT therapy is like, there's always things that you can work on. There's always different strategies that they can learn. So it's an ongoing thing that you can do to always help your child to be better able to kind of navigate and do whatever they can. All right. Well, thanks Robin. Appreciate yeah. all that. Um, you know, one of the questions we get, um, like you mentioned, is really fortunate that you're close enough and that you also had a, vestibular therapist yeah. close by in Kentucky that was accessible to you. But I asked the group also, like, how how do you recommend it if you don't live near some place that has specific PT and rehab type? I don't know. Sure. So um, I, I make sure I really talk to the family. So, you know, we have our assessment um, and then I really do a lot of education at the end with the family, making sure that, you know, they understand that. Um, it's really, so you need to go back to, you know, your local, you know, physical therapist and talk to them about how, you know, utilizing, um, the eyes and the feet for balance is going to be, um, is going to be the, the biggest bang for the buck, for your buck. Okay. in training the, you know, your child's balance system. And so I get very detailed in my write up, um, so that families don't have to remember everything, but so they can, you know, print it off and take it to their PT and say, you know, the, the you know, the, Gretchen said we should work on different surfaces, walking and standing on them, that we need to learn how to move, you know, walk and in turn to look at things, you know, having objects, um, you know, stickers on the wall or whatever it may be um, to kind of instigate and promote that, that safety with standing and walking. So I just do a lot of a lot of education, um, especially if they're just going to be there for that, that one visit. Mm -hmm. um, and always make sure, you know, anybody can contact me, your you know, family, your PT, whatever it may be. We can kind of problem solve and game plan. Cool. So, yeah. um, for the families, uh, what might be helpful is, like I know on the physical therapy side, but also, also on the audiology side, you guys go through additional training more than the typical PT sure. or audiology training to get up to speed on vestibular rehab. Mm -hmm. So what kind of credentials or what kind of training history should the families look for in somebody? Sure, I'll start with the audiology piece. So now with the advent of the, um, the doctorate level for audiologists, the entry level doctoral <clears throat> degree, what we're finding is that now the students are actually trained in vestibular testing. So for years when it was a master's level degree, um, I would find most audiologists probably didn't have a lot of vestibular training in the past. But now since the audiology doctoral, uh, the doctorate degree is now a four year degree, there is more training for vestibular testing. So we're finding that the students are coming out very well trained um, for the sake of vestibular. Now, that being said, when it translates down to pediatrics, um, we're not finding that. So just because there's so few centers that actually do pediatric vestibular testing. So um, we're one of the training centers, and I know there's several other children's hospitals around the country. I can tell you notably, um, the ones that we work closely with would be Boston Children's and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Those are big centers of excellence where they're doing pediatric vestibular um, testing and uh, retraining DuPont Children's in Wilmington. And there's great centers out there that are that are already doing this. There's plenty more. I could go through a long list, but it's a great place. Yeah. Um, so from a PT standpoint, um, the American Physical Therapy Association uh, or the APTA has a um, vestibular competency based course. And so uh, myself and the um, other therapists that are vestibular trained here at Children's, that was um, we kind of set the bar for ourselves that we wanted to make sure we went through that and got certified through that. Um, I also did the advanced competency course a few years later to continue my my learning and whatnot. Both of those are very adult based. So I've had to take a lot of what I learned there and adapt it for the pediatric population and which makes it fun. You know, it's, it's all about making it fun for the kids and it makes it challenging and fun for us as therapists to figure out how to translate that um, from the adult base to the um, pediatric base. But there's also another great course that's offered. So to the um, really like international leaders are uh, Rosemary Ryan and uh, Jennifer Braswell Christie and they hold a, um, a 
pediatric vista rehab course in Jacksonville every year, um, usually in the fall. And, um, and so additional training is available there for physical therapists. So I think those are like the top three, um, you know, kind of certifications and really building your knowledge when it comes to vestibular specific rehab. Um, trying to think about else. So those are the big things. You can also, as a, so, you know, as Violet said, you can search, you know, look at different pediatric hospitals to see if they have like a pediatric balance center or something specific for vestibular rehab, you know, that may be closer to home for you. Um, the other um, resource I often give families is vestibular.org. Um, you can find a professional on that website. You can plug in your zip code. Are you looking for an ENT? Are you looking for a PT? Whatever it may be. And, um, you know, there's, tons of professionals listed on that website as well. So there's different ways to, mm -hmm. to find um, the appropriate professionals, you know, no matter where you live. The remarkable thing in, is that it's probably one of the more operator dependent pieces. Like I've seen patients who have gotten vestibular rehab elsewhere and parents really, really didn't notice a big difference. Let's try a different approach here. And I think if you get somebody who's really good at what they do, it, it can be really impactful. I would just say that, you know, also like we had a great PT for Grayson, like who before when he was in um, first steps mm -hmm. and he was he had worked with other children who had charge syndrome. So even oh. if you can't find someone who specializes in vestibular PT, like if you ask them if they've worked with children who have charge syndrome mm -hmm. or other syndromes that have similar issues, um, then that still might be very helpful as well, because they have that experience and understand like those kids who. Um, have different like challenges that maybe typical kids who go to PT might not have. So I think that really helped us as well. Like give Grayson that extra boost in the beginning is because he had worked with a child who was similar to Grayson. So are you guys surprised by the polling results? Yes. In terms of when? Yes. And I'm, I'm pleased. <laughs> I am too. I am that so many families are aware of, you know, this, this challenge that's, um, uh, you know, it, like Robin said, that first year of life is so medically complex. And so it's understandable that if your child's balance system isn't, a, you know, a topic of, you know, in the top, you know, five things of things to talk about that first year and stuff like that. So I'm definitely encouraged by the fact that that discussion is happening, um, you know, with families and stuff early on. It's really, really yeah, great. I'm, I'm really surprised. And I wonder if it's um, maybe kudos to our neo neonatologists. You know, early on, it used to be maybe you were into your first year of life or even beyond when you would get finally diagnosed with charge officially. Mm -hmm. But I think that age has really marched down as the awareness of charge has yeah. increased among the neonatologists. But this really surprises me that they know the nuances that there are inner ear vestibular defects that yep. go along with it. Uh, so in line with this, though, like one of the questions that comes out is when do you think you should start engaging in vestibular rehab. Gretchen, do you want to answer that? So I encourage, again, you know, these your children in charge are, are going to have challenges with gross motor skills from the get-go, you know, in, including, you know, sitting and, and things along that line. So I encourage at least getting an evaluation with a vestibular rehab PT um, to kind of set the bar and get a baseline. Um, and, you know, it may be that it's more feasible for the family to, you know, to do first steps during that time, but then we have periodic check-ins. Maybe it's like every four months or so. And then if we're really finding that maybe they're stalling or not, you know, kind of plateaued or something like that, that's the time to kind of like bring in the vestibular specific PT mm -hmm. so we can really hone in on, um, you know, and kind of assess and see where maybe where we're missing out and where we can continue to plug in more vestibular specific PT. So I, I encourage during infancy, um, you know, really during that first year to at least get the, the baseline and evaluation. And so the families are aware of what's out there um, and continue to keep that, those lines of communication open. And from my testing point of view, um, it's really easy to do a test on somebody who is not 18 months old. I feel like around developmentally 18 months old, sometimes there's a, um, there's a challenge because there's that fear of going to the hospital, of going to the doctor. So sometimes when we get them a little bit younger, we can get a good assessment on them in audiology. For example, we have a chair and it rotates. It sounds worse than it is, but it actually goes kind of slow side to side. And what we're actually doing is stimulating the inner ear to look to see if that VOR pops out. And we just have a camera on their faces. There's nothing touching them. They're in a car seat that's similar 
similar to what they ride in in the car already. And some of the moms do tell me they hate the car seat or they don't like going in the car. So that's sometimes a challenge. But we let them bring snacks. We let the moms stay next to them the whole time. Uh, we sing songs or we've had interpreters that will sign because it's dark into their hands and those types of things. Um, but we are watching for that vestibular ocular reflex. And um, that's a lot easier to catch when they're younger or when they're, you know, around one year. Um, but it's very difficult sometimes around that two-year-old stage um, just because they have a lot of fear of going to the hospital at that age. Then it gets easier again when they get a little bit older. So when they're two and a half, three years old, it gets a little bit easier again. So Robin, as we get close to the wrap-up time for us, I'm wondering if you could share some of the parts I were wondered about as these guys were talking as you're sharing your stories. Everything from walking downstairs alone to normal activities outside and you're so used used to catching your kid before their face plant right? yeah and then as you're working on developing these skills how do you live into just kind of letting your kid start doing these things as you see you know they're capable of doing them it's it's not easy i would say um but we i mean i still like we will let him go down the stairs by himself but like i walk backwards in front of him like <laughs> so i don't know how by himself that is <laughs> right. um but if it's a couple of stairs, then I would probably not do that, like an entire flight of stairs. You know, you've got to kind of judge, you know, the safety risk based on what you think they can do. Now, outside, um, our backyard is pretty safe from serious dangers. Mm -hmm. um, so he just runs around like a typical kid in the backyard. He can go in and out of the playhouse, the clubhouse, um, up and down the stairs. He climbs up the slide, which I makes me nervous, but... <laughs> I try not to, to hover, um, but he seems to do fine doing all of these things. So um, I think at first, like we would, like he wanted to climb up the slide because his older brother climbs up the slide, right? You know, that's what kids do. Mm -hmm. um, so we would stand right there and then you see that he can do it okay, you know, so then you a little bit further back and things like that. Um, but he's had two sessions or two 12 week sessions. And so I've seen, really he's improved quite a bit so now i feel a little bit more comfortable like lengthening that like yeah um i don't know i can um, imagine that's yeah. hard though it's very hard to to know like because you don't want to be like a crazy hovering parent all the time <laughs> but you also don't want to go to the emergency room every week um you know because uh -huh. your kid fell down the stairs again or whatever so you got to find a, a balance i think and um it does get easier once they once you see that they can do those things like more and more frequently, but um, yeah. And I think for us, it's just making sure that we know that those big safety things are, are out of the way. I might hover more at a playground where we haven't been before until I see that he can mm -hmm. do it or um, you know, where they have like those openings and the tall parts of the playgrounds. Like, I don't know that he would know that that's, a big mm -hmm. opening and he would fall out of that. So that might be a place where you kind of judge, you know, the risk. That's just kind of my, my take on it. We just try to let him be him as much as you can in the safest environment without being a crazy protective <laughs> parent. <laughs> All right. Totally easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we're wrapping up close to an hour. So uh, first, thanks to Robin, Gretchen, Violet, um, I think hopefully a lot of useful, pragmatic information for you guys on a topic that may not be really familiar with to a lot of you. Uh, but please send in questions uh, even afterwards. Uh, we'll make sure that anything that comes in online um, during the rest of the day, we'll try and get answers back to you. And always feel free to reach out. Lucy's our default contact person for those of you who don't know our charge center. So thanks very much for tuning in and stay tuned for more stuff. Thank you. <laughs>